Good evening. evening. Welcome to our worship tonight at St. Paul's. Uh, Tonight is Maundy Thursday. The word Maundy is related to a, uh, a Latin word that means command. And it comes from Jesus' statement, a new command I give you, love one another. And you say to yourself, well, that's not a new command. Jesus said love one another, but that's in the Old Testament too, right? So how was it a new command? Well, he said, love one another as I love you. And then he took that depth of service, that depth of love to another level. So he took an old command and gave it new and deeper meaning on Maundy Thursday. We'll talk about that tonight as we meditate on how Jesus served his disciples and serves us as well. So welcome to our worship this evening. And to those who are joining us online, welcome to you as well. We begin our worship with hymn 136. It's on page 8 in your worship folder. Please stand. On this night, Christ Jesus gathered with his disciples in the upper room. On this night, Christ, the suffering servant, took a towel and washed the disciples' feet, saying, A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. On this night, Christ our Lord gave us his holy supper, that we who eat this bread and drink this cup may proclaim his death, receive his body and blood, have his forgiveness, and on the last day share in his resurrection. 
On this night, Christ, the Lamb of God, gave himself into the hands of those who would slay him and was abandoned by those who follow him. We pray. Lord Jesus, you are the Lamb of God pictured in the ancient Passover feast, now giving to us your own body and your own blood in holy communion, just as the Passover lambs assured the Israelites of God's promise to deliver them from death, strengthen our belief that the bread is your real body and the wine is your real blood, given to us for our forgiveness, life, and salvation. Prepare us to receive this sacrament, remembering your death and repenting of our sins. Unite us by our oneness of faith throughout this congregation and our synod, and love us to the end that we may love others as you have loved us. In your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. In the Old Testament, the Lord commanded his people as they were exiting Egypt to do something. And it would be something that he would have them repeat for years and years and years throughout their generations as a people. And it was this, that as the Lord brought that last and worst plague of death upon Egypt, that those who would take the blood of a lamb that they sacrificed and paint it around their door frames that those who sheltered in the shadow of the blood of the Lamb would be saved from death. And though Israel does to this day celebrate that same festival and they remember their freedom from, from Egypt, it wasn't just for that purpose. It was also to point ahead to the greater deliverance that would come through Jesus, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. That those of us who are sheltered under the blood of Jesus, the Lord passes over our sins because of the work he did for us. Listen to the institution of this festival by the Lord. The Lord told Moses and Aaron this in the land of Egypt. This month is to be the beginning of your calendar. It is to be the first month of the year for you. Tell the entire Israelite community that on the tenth day of this month, they are to take a lamb or a kid goat for themselves, according to their father's households. One lamb per household. But if the household is too small for a whole lamb, then that person and his neighbor next door to him must select one based on the number of people. Determine what size of lamb is needed according to how much each person will eat. Your lamb must be unblemished, a year old male. You may take it from the sheep or the goats. You are to keep it until the 14th day of this month. Then the whole assembly of the Israelite community is to slaughter the lambs at sunset. They shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and the lintel of the houses where they eat the lamb. That night they shall eat the meat that has been roasted over a fire along with unleavened bread. They shall eat it with bitter herbs. Do not eat it raw or boiled in water, but roast it over a fire with its head, its legs, and its internal organs. You shall not leave any of it until the morning. Whatever remains until the morning, you shall burn in the fire. This is how you are to eat it, with your cloak tucked into your belt, ready for travel, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. Eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. For on that night I will pass through the land of Egypt. I will strike down every firstborn in the land of Egypt, both people and animals. Against all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. The blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. There will be no plague among you to destroy you when I strike down the land of Egypt. This day shall be a memorial for you, and you are to celebrate it as a festival to the Lord. Throughout your generations, you must celebrate it as a permanent regulation. This is the word of our Lord. We continue with hymn 112, verse 1. There is a fountain filled with blood, Emmanuel was slain, and sinners who are washed therein lose every guilty stain, lose every guilty stain. 
Our second lesson is a short lesson, but an important one. From Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 10, Paul talks about the Lord's Supper, that supper that he instituted. It was part of the Passover festival, but he gave it a deeper, a deeper meaning. And he, he gave it this meaning that now has significance for us, that this cup of blessing which he blessed that night it is not just part of the Passover festival anymore, but it represents, and not only represents, but is in a very real way his body and his blood given and shed for us. It is a communion with him and with one another. The cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a communion of the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a communion of the body of Christ? Because there is one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. This is the word of our Lord. Dear dying Lamb, your precious blood, power till all the ransom church of God be saved and sin no more, be saved and sin no more. Please stand for our gospel lesson. Our gospel lesson, which is the basis for the sermon this evening, is taken from John chapter 13. Before the Passover festival, Jesus knew that the time had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved those who were his own in the world, he loved them to the end. By the time the supper took place, the devil had already put in the idea into the heart of Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going back to God. He got up from the supper and laid aside his outer garment. He took a towel and tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with a the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who asked him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus answered him, You do not understand what I am doing now, but later you will understand. Peter told him, You will never, ever wash my feet. Jesus replied, If I do not wash you, you have no part with me. Lord, not just my feet, Simon Peter replied, but also my hands and my head. Jesus told him, A person who has had a bath needs only to wash his feet, but his body is completely clean. And you are clean, but not all of you. Indeed, he knew who was going to betray him. That is why he said, not all of you are clean. After Jesus had washed their feet and put on his outer garment, he reclined at the table again. Do you understand what I have done for you? He asked them, You call me teacher and Lord. You are right, because I am. And now if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. Yes, I have given you an example, so that you also would do just as I have done for you. Amen. Amen, I tell you. A servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. This is the gospel of our Lord. You may be seated for our hymn of the evening, hymn 714, The Lamb, on page 9. Uh.
Brothers and sisters in Jesus, grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. Amen. It was a celebration. The two of them were seated at a restaurant with white linen tablecloths, fine china and champagne flutes. They began to peruse the menu, and they waited for their server. Ten minutes passed. And then twenty. And nobody came to offer them even a glass of water. Each of them was waiting, patiently or impatiently, I guess. But they were really hungry, and yet they were celebrating their wedding anniversary, and and they were happily reminiscing, and so they waited. They opted to avoid any public confrontation. But when the wait stretched to nearly 30 minutes, the husband pretended to go to the restroom so that he could find someone to give a piece of his mind to. He saw a man who looked like someone of standing in the restaurant, and he began to unload on the man and explain his displeasure. Just as he started, though, he was interrupted. I'm sorry, sir, but my attention is needed at another table. I'll be with you in a moment. And that was it. He had been put off for the last time. He returned to the table, gathered up his wife, and he left in a huff. Have you ever had a similar experience? Whether you've been to a retail store where the the clerk paid you no attention, or you've been to a hospital where you felt the nursing staff neglected you, or you've tried to negotiate a a reasonable window of time for the direct TV man to show up, you know that good service can be hard to find. Bad service is frustrating. The Internet has spawned rating systems online, presumably so you can find the good providers of service, but most of those sites are really just filled with over-the-top negative reviews from jilted customers who just want to tell their horror stories, or maybe a bunch of fake positive reviews from the service providers themselves. God created people to depend on each other and their acts of service. Many of us have an expertise that others are going to require at some time in their lives, but the time will come when each of us needs someone else's expertise to help us through life. Taxes, health care, home, car repair, and so forth. I'm one of the most non-car guys you could possibly find. And so when I find an auto mechanic who is competent, who is honest, who is reasonably priced and does a good job, I am very loyal to that person. And I will stick with that person until I move somewhere else and have to find someone else. Serving one another is so critical to our existence and good service is so rare that we're often willing to honor those who do their jobs especially well with handsome tips and enthusiastic referrals, aren't we? Now, if that's the case for all these things I just mentioned, then you will certainly, we certainly ought to be ready to refer our friends and relatives to Jesus, and and maybe to your enemies too. When you learn about the kind of service that God provides, right? In tonight's lesson, Jesus doesn't just provide incomparable service to his disciples, but he does it for free, with no demands of payment, without pulling rank, without excuse making, without being condescending or patronizing. Jesus serves his disciples simply with his hands of humility. Now, Jesus had a lot on his mind that night, things that could have distracted him from this task. John repeatedly records the interplay between Jesus' divine and human natures, especially how Jesus knew ahead of time what was about to happen. John tells us that Jesus knew the time had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. He knew. He knew ahead of time that within 24 hours, Hours he would lay down his life for the sins of the world. He knew ahead of time that Satan had baited Judas to betray him. 
He knew that the Father had laid all things at His feet. And He entered the evening with complete omnipotence and omniscience. Yet, rather than leveraging His full authority in some dazzling display of the divine, what did He do? He exercised complete and total humility. While Jesus' mind raced with anticipation of the pain of sin and, and, and the suffering of hell, while He foresaw the cross He would endure, lovingly conscious of the souls He would redeem, His disciples, what were they doing? They were engaged in a petty argument over which of them was to be the greatest. Can you imagine anyone being more oblivious, more insensitive to the needs of Jesus? Their quibbling carried over into the upper room where they realized there was no servant on duty to wash their filthy feet before the Passover. Then who was going to do it? Which one of the disciples would step up and volunteer? Even in the middle of their silly fight, you would think someone, someone would just decide to do it for Jesus. But no, they just sat there. They sat there maybe with their arms folded, glaring at each other, wondering which of them was going to make the first step. Not one man reached for the bucket until Jesus did. Now, Jesus had had a long history of having his love unrequited. Jesus once fed 5,000 people, but most of them never truly believed. They really just were more interested in what he could give them. The political elite in Jerusalem, his people, the leaders of his people were busy plotting his death, right? And now his own disciples were arguing over who was the greatest on the night before Jesus' own death. Would any of us blame Jesus if his frustration had boiled over and he walked away? Forget it. These people don't deserve me. I've done enough for these guys already. It's time for me to think of myself. Now, of course, he didn't do that. But how many of us would have had those thoughts if we were in Jesus' place? Right? I think I probably would have myself. Even more maddening, Jesus had settled this argument before. In a previous incident, when James and John sent their mother to advocate for them to sit at Jesus' right and left hands in heaven, Jesus had already taught the disciples how to be great. When he said, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be your slave. On this Thursday evening, Jesus didn't opt for another lecture, but he chose instead to model for them with his actions what humble service looks like. We're told he got up from the supper and laid aside his outer garment. He took a towel and tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. If Jesus would have blown a gasket, we could have understood, but Christ's love never wavered, did it? Without even a hint of frustration, without a hint of exasperation, Jesus handled their pride with perfect patience. He overcame their arrogance with humble service. The King of creation, the one who has all authority in heaven and on earth, he bent the knee to serve his disciples with a task so menial that servants would have jockeyed to avoid it. Christ came from heaven on a mission from his Father to redeem the world. And he wasn't about to quit at the 11th hour. Having loved those who were his own in the world, he loved them to the end. Most of our Christian service, it falls short, doesn't it? It falls short because we base it on the behavior of our neighbor. We shun people who don't agree with us. Maybe doctors are slow to follow up on patients who are the most belligerent. Maybe servers in restaurants treat difficult, arrogant customers differently. And inside our own families, don't we tiptoe around the hotheads and, and we walk on eggshells around that opinionated relative? Worse yet, we sinfully justify our own poor Christian service by suggesting, well, they had it coming. They had it coming. They were being obnoxious. And the irony, of course, is that while we try to justify our own behavior and blame our neighbor for being obnoxious, we end up being obnoxious ourselves. We do the same thing. If Jesus based his service on the disciples' behavior that night, 
no one would have had their feet washed. No one would have had their sins forgiven because Jesus would have never made it to the cross. Jesus' humility shines brighter and greater than ours because it's not based on human behavior. Jesus' humility is based on God's love. Jesus' humility is based on His grace. He serves us because He loves us. And His love is unconditional. His love is is perfect. Not our behavior. Not our behavior, but God's love moved Him to wrap the towel around His waist and wash their feet. And He even washed Judas' feet too. You don't get the idea that Jesus would ever walk out of a restaurant upset over poor service. He didn't walk out on his disciples, and he didn't walk out on you either. He came to serve you. The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Christ's obedient death served you and me well. It paid the ransom price for our pride, for our entitled attitudes, for our obnoxious rank pulling, for making people feel smaller or lesser, and for every other shallow, insecure excuse we've ever offered our neighbor or God for our failure to serve. And so we can be thankful at this truth, that the blood of Jesus, His Son, purifies us from all sin. The disciples had a history of missing the point. After Jesus had washed their feet, it would have been natural for them to feel ashamed then. Their disgraceful bickering and pompous attitudes had been laid low by Jesus' humble hands. Jesus, though, wanted to do much more than shame their pride. He wanted to rewire their attitudes and invite them to use their hands of humility. And so He invited them. He said, Now, if I, your Lord and Teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. Yes, I have given you an example that you also would do just as I have done for you. Jesus was their Lord and teacher. And by virtue of His office, He was their superior. But He didn't wag His title in their faces, did He? He didn't shove His superiority down their throats or use it to avoid humble service to them. No, He just served. And for us tonight, washing one another's feet means it is to show Jesus' love to our fellow man. It's a kind of love that forgets to feel superior. It's a love that stoops to the lowest level of service and and is blind to what it is doing or, or who it is serving. It's a love that serves so freely it pays no attention to what it costs. It's a love so humble it voluntarily serves, regardless of how others act. It's a love so pure, it doesn't seek recognition of man, but only the approval of God. Friends, Jesus came to serve. And the service He provides is incomparable. And it's free. Jesus' humble death purifies us of our poor service. And Jesus' humble hands satisfy God's holiness and provide the motive to serve our neighbor. So heed Christ's call. Wash each other's feet. Love and serve your neighbor like Jesus did, with humility. If you're in a position of authority in your family or in the world or in your workplace, use that authority as Jesus did. Adopt His attitude, which didn't seek to publicly display or use that authority to lord it over others. Just love and serve as Jesus loved and served. Humility permeated his life, permeated his teaching. It colored his servant attitude. Let Jesus' humility and servant attitude rework your attitude and my attitude too. We should simply ask, how can I serve? Who can I serve? Jesus said that night, if you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. It's a call to action, isn't it? Brothers and sisters, thank God Jesus didn't choose to treat us according to our sinful attitudes, but rather according to His loving grace and mercy. Thank God that He washed His disciples' feet 
But above all, thank God that He washed the guilt of our sins away at the cross. And thank God that tonight He will share His true body and blood with us in a mysterious but very real way in His Holy Supper. In Jesus' precious name, Amen. And the peace of God which passes all understanding will keep your hearts and minds through faith in Jesus your Lord. Amen. I ask the congregation to please stand. We turn to page 4 and we're going to pray a prayer confessing our sins followed by the Lord's Prayer. You are holy, O God of majesty, and blessed is Jesus Christ, your Son. As one of us, he knew our joys and sorrows. He shared our struggle with temptation. He was like us in every way, yet had no sin. In him we see that you created us to be. Though blameless, he suffered willingly for our sin. Though innocent, he accepted death for the guilty. On the cross, he offered himself a perfect sacrifice for the sins of the world. By his suffering and death, he frees us from sin and death. Risen from the grave, he leads us to the joy of a new life. Increase our faith, O Lord, and give us courage to confess it. Increase our faith as we receive your word and sacrament. Amen. Brothers and sisters, in the Lord's Supper, Christ is present by the power of His Word and offers up His body given into death and His blood shed for the forgiveness of sins. As we prepare to receive these great gifts, let us confess our sins and hear the promise of forgiveness. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and lead us to everlasting life. We pray. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. God be merciful to you and strengthen your faith. And let his face shine upon us as we trust in his forgiveness. As you believe, so let it be. By the command of our Lord Jesus Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ has given us a holy supper in which we receive His true body and blood for the forgiveness of sins and the strengthening of our faith. In this supper, we celebrate the gift of redemption. We bear witness to the fellowship we share as confessors of the truth, and we proclaim His death until He returns. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give Him thanks and praise. Praise to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In love He has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. He made His Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of His Christ. To Him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be praise and thanks and honor and glory forever and ever. Amen.
Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. You may be seated. So, we are in the process of slowly returning to a sort of a normalcy of communion procedure, but for this evening, we're going to take the change a little gently. We still have the elements both in cups, bread, and wine. Um, but I'm going to invite you, if you would desire to kneel, feel free to kneel. Um, don't feel obligated to kneel. I think that's an individual choice. But it's something we weren't encouraging, and I'd like to encourage you to do it if that's what you would like to do. Um, certainly not necessary. Uh, come for the Lord's table. He is prepared. Oh, and take the bread and the wine out of the tray is how we're going to do it tonight, as opposed to me handing it to you. Take and eat. This is the true body of your Savior and your Lord, Jesus Christ, given unto death for your sins. Take and drink. This is the true blood of your Savior poured out for you for the forgiveness of your sins. May this true body and blood of Jesus strengthen and preserve you in the true faith until life everlasting. Be at peace. Your sins are forgiven. Take and eat. This is the true body of your Savior and your Lord, Jesus Christ, given unto death for your sins. Take and drink. This is the true blood of your Savior, Jesus, poured out for you for the forgiveness of your sins. May this true body and blood of Jesus strengthen and preserve you in the true faith until life everlasting. Be at peace, knowing your sins are forgiven. Amen. Take and eat. This is the true body of your Savior and your Lord, Jesus Christ, given unto death for your sins. Take and drink. This is the true blood of your Savior and your Lord, Jesus Christ, poured out for you for the forgiveness of your sins. May this true body and blood of Jesus strengthen and preserve you in the true faith until life everlasting. Be at peace. Your sins are forgiven. Amen. Take and eat. This is the true body of your Savior and your Lord, Jesus Christ, given unto death for the forgiveness of your sins. Take and drink. This is the true blood of your Savior, poured out for you on the cross for the forgiveness of all of your sins. May this true body and blood of Jesus strengthen and preserve you in the true faith until life everlasting. 
be at peace. Your sins are forgiven. Savior and your Lord Jesus Christ, given unto death for your sins. Take and drink. This is the true blood of your Savior and your Lord Jesus Christ, poured out for you on the cross for the forgiveness of your sins. May this true body and blood of Jesus strengthen and preserve you in the true faith until life everlasting. Be at peace. Your sins are forgiven. Amen. is the true body of your Savior and your Lord Jesus Christ, given unto death for your sins. Take and drink. This is the true blood of your Savior, poured out for you on the cross for the forgiveness of your sins. May this true body and blood of Jesus strengthen and preserve you in the true faith until life everlasting. Be at peace. Your sins are forgiven. Take and eat. This is the true body of your Savior and your Lord, Jesus Christ, given unto death for your sins. Take and drink. This is the true blood of your Savior, Jesus, poured out for you for the forgiveness of all of your sins. May this true body and blood of Jesus strengthen and preserve you in the true faith until life everlasting. Be at peace. Your sins are forgiven. Amen. This is the true body of your Savior and your Lord, Jesus Christ, given unto death for the forgiveness of your sins. Take and drink. This is the true blood of your Savior and your Lord, Jesus Christ, poured out for you for the forgiveness of your sins. May this true body and blood of your Savior strengthen and preserve you in the true faith until life everlasting. Be at peace. Your sins are forgiven. Amen. Take and eat. This is the true body of your Savior and your Lord Jesus Christ, given unto death for your sins. Take and drink the true blood of your Savior poured out for you for the forgiveness of your sins. May this true body and blood of Jesus strengthen and preserve you in the true faith until life everlasting. Be at peace. Your sins are forgiven. Amen.
Please stand. Brothers and sisters, go in peace. Live in harmony with one another. And yes, serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. You may be seated. Our closing hymn is hymn 112. It's verses 2, 4, and 5. And you can find that on page 11. Good evening. Welcome to our worship at St. Paul's. It's good to have you here. Uh, tomorrow night at 7 p.m. we have our Good Friday worship. It'll be a tenebrae service with the gradual extinguishing of candles, readings. There will be a sermon based on Christ's first word from the cross. Last year I preached on his last word from the cross. So uh, same service as last year when you were all not able to be here. Um, we're going to repeat it, but uh, the sermon will be different, so if you remember last year, you won't be hearing the same sermon over again. So, God bless you, God keep you. I look forward to seeing you tomorrow evening. There is also worship at Faith in Lancaster at 5.30, if that works better for some people. Uh, and on Sunday and Saturday, we have our normal weekend schedule uh, that we've been having uh, for worship. So, I look forward to passing through this weekend with you. Thank you, and God bless you.